Well, good afternoon, evening, slash, I think it still is afternoon here at 536. Um, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today for one of many exciting events hosted by the Communication Design MFA program here at Texas State. Uh, my name is Mark Menjavar. I'm an artist based in San Antonio and professor in the School of Art and Design here. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Margot Handworker. Um, she is the director of our galleries. Um, together, Margot and I are co-teaching a course on exhibitions this semester. Um, I'd also like to introduce Alice Lee and Molly Sherman, uh, amazing artists, designers, professors, and co-advisors of the MFA program here today. I think Michael is here with us, the director of our school, and all the faculty, staff, and students at our school for their support. I want to give a special thank you to Michelle Hernandez, uh, the program assistant for the MFA program. She did so much of the work behind the scenes to make this evening possible. So thank you, Michelle. Uh, we ask that you mute your audio to limit interruptions and distractions. You're welcome to, but not expected to, turn off your video. Uh, we do ask that you turn it on if you feel comfortable during the Q&A portion, which will come after Mark uh, talks. We are recording this event and we will share the recording on the Texas State Communication Design YouTube channel when we have that process. So I am incredibly excited tonight to have Mark Fisher with us. I have been a huge fan of Mark's work for a number of years. Uh, some of his publications were really, really influential on my early practice of working with publications. We also have over 85 of his publications in the library. We've been collecting those over the years. And some of you may know, but back in 2013, Mark had an exhibition in our gallery. So Mark, we're really excited to have you here. I'm gonna jump in and read a little more formal bio and then toss it over to you. So Mark Fisher is the administrator of Public Collectors, an initiative he formed in 2007. Public Collectors aims to encourage greater access and scholarship for marginal cultural materials, particularly those that museums ignore. Public Collector's work includes the Library Excavations Publication Series and a web project, Quarantine, which produced 100 single-page publications with over 75 collaborators at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, and Malachi Richter, a project about the late Chicago music documentarian activist produced for the 2014 Whitney Biennial. Public Collector's also initiated the Courtroom Artist Residency, for this project, Fisher brought artists to observe criminal court in Chicago, followed by a discussion over a meal at Taqueria El Milagro in Chicago's little village neighborhood. The conversations were turned into a publication series, The Courtroom Artist Residency Report. Fisher recently completed the book Public Collector's Police Scanner, which I have my copy right here. Um, and uh, which is the result of 75 days of note taking while listening to live police radio in Chicago. In addition to public collectors, Fisher is also a member of the group Temporary Services, which was founded in 1998, and a partner in its publishing imprint, Half Letter Press, which has been ongoing since 2008. Temporary Services and Half Letter Press have produced over 125 publications, and Fisher has created over 55 publications under the public collector's imprint. He is based in Chicago. Mark, we are thrilled to have you here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, in, in, a, in a better world, I would be uh, in Texas with you and would have had uh, breakfast tacos this morning. <laughs> but, uh, so it, it's, it's, you know, but I'm, I'm really grateful for this invitation and uh, happy to do this uh, in the way that we can. Um, I'm so glad that Skype has been like phased out for these kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, this is definitely an improvement over that at least. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and um, I will uh, move pretty quickly and hopefully um, not leave out uh, anything um, critical. Um, so. Um, Mark also mentioned temporary services in half flutter press. I'm going to focus on the work of public collectors. Um, and before I get into that, I feel like sometimes a, a, in terms of my publishing background, um, it's maybe helpful to show um, some very early things starting uh, when I was 17 years old. Um, 
so uh, um so these are the first two issues of uh, a fanzine I published starting in high school called Primary Concern. Um, at the time I was uh, 17, I was super into hardcore punk, underground speed metal, um, but having no musical abilities, uh, too young to be a DJ, too inexperienced to book concerts or something like that. Um, you know, there was this idea of wanting to contribute to that culture in some way. And when I started seeing my first examples of photocopied zines, that felt like a really exciting point of entry. I, I liked writing. I liked visual. I was interested in, you know, was, visual art was, um, you know, something I was really passionate about. Um, graphic design was something I was trying to figure out uh, how to do as I went. Um, and uh you know the prospect of of interviewing bands reviewing records uh writing editorials all of that stuff collaborating with um other people who wanted to contribute was super appealing to me so i produced seven issues of primary concern um these are the first two um <laughs> these are these are some of my colleagues uh the uh editors of poser death Eye for an Eye, which was published by my friend Tony Rettman in New Jersey. Um, I love this this issue uh, with Glenn Danzig on the cover. It has like, you can actually see the tape, you know, like the, you know, scotch tape that's holding the layout together and this like crappy dot matrix printing. Um, but yeah, Tony's someone who like still writing about music uh, is like a legit author of multiple books on music um but yeah this is like where he started when he was like 15 14 years old uh disarray feedback a lot of these things would come to me through the mail as uh exchanges for my own publication and that early introduction to the kind of generosity of a publishing community like the zine world is something that i really carry with me um in the work that i do now um so skipping ahead uh how many years was like 15 or so no like 25 years um public collectors is something i started in 2007 um kind of at first with an interest in coordinating access to people who had some area of knowledge or expertise that maybe is not thoughtfully regarded or the subject of scholarship by museums or typically something uh, things you can find in public libraries a lot of the kind of subjects i was interested in the kinds of creative work i was interested in are things that often happen outside of a gallery or a museum purview and some of the really you know in order to really learn about some of the things that are important to me i often have to go to the people who are involved in that work directly um working in artist groups for example artist groups you know typically don't move through museum worlds and it's through like through meeting members of those groups and going to their homes um or seeing how um you know people who are like enthusiasts of uh records or zines often like i mean going to going to visit those people and them sharing all of this material directly with you is sometimes the richest way to experience that kind of stuff um so this project hardcore architecture uh that i started in 2015 it was kind of an outgrowth of a couple different things um my interest in underground music my participation in that culture um the adult realities of uh becoming a homeowner and using google street view endlessly to try to understand neighborhoods before going to look at houses <laughs> with a real estate agent uh, we gained very comfortable with navigating the world on Google Street View. Um, and um, and then also uh, some developments in, in strategies for how to research something. So um, how to research a project like this. So Maximum Rock and Roll was a very long run volunteer driven magazine that started in Berkeley, then San Francisco in around 1982, I believe, um, just recently stopped publishing a couple of years ago. And this was a formative magazine um, 
in my youth. This was like how I learned about new hardcore punk records, demos. And to my, I, I have a lot of copies of this magazine myself, um, but to my amazement, Harold Washington Library, the largest public library in Chicago, actually had a complete run of this magazine, which to me suggests that um, a very uh, enlightened librarian, perhaps also punk musician, had the um, you know foresight uh, to think that this is something the library should officially subscribe to and never let the subscription lapse. So I was amazed when I found that all of these magazines that I had such a hard time locating when I was growing up were at the public library. You have to ask to see them, so it's not obvious that they're there. Um, this is more like what my copies look like. Um, uh, someone also just gave me a whole pile of their old issues because they were tired of moving them around every time they moved. Um, uh, issue on the left featuring um, one of my favorite bands from Italy, the amazingly named Cheetah Chrome Motherfuckers. Um, that War Against Women issue, I believe, features, I've been told, features the earliest writing of published writing of Rebecca Solnit. So a lot of really amazing people moved through this magazine contribute, contributing in some ways over the years. Um, so a typical aspect of this publication is um, in the record reviews, they would review any kind of self-released music as long as it somehow fit um, the focus of the magazine. So if you recorded a cassette in your garage and it was punk or in underground in nature, they would review it. And the reviews are really short, but um, nonetheless, you know, they helped propagate this, this music and this culture. Um, so you'll see here, there's like a little tiny review for the demo cassette Life in Grave by Cryptic Slaughter, um, written by the graphic artist Pusshead, um, who a lot of people know for like doing art for bands like Metallica and stuff like that. And this like super hyperbolic um, review says, uh, zooming speedcore mayhem with wild metallic bites and machine gun drumming, rough growling vocals float over this cryptic slaughter mix the textures of DRI Slayer CFA and the possessed to bring forth uh, a so uh, one monster of rapid fire acceleration for this young band wild and intense sorry my eyes are failing me trying to read that um, so uh, so if, uh, so you know this review provides you with a home address that you would send your three dollars to to receive this cassette and that's common in this that a lot of people are still living with their parents they were in college dorms so in my google street view mode i visited uh this address on chelsea avenue in santa monica and found uh this little apartment complex and um this is just a screenshot from the blog for the project, which is hardcorearchitecture.tumblr.com. Um, and every post I include the um, indication of uh, the release, where it is, zip code, the um, issue number of Maximum Rock and Roll, the date of that Street View captured it. And then there's like a little sample from the quote from the review. So I posted this and then I get this message on um, Tumblr from the, a Tumblr account organized by, uh, managed by a former member of this band, uh, saying, hey, Mark, this is Les from Cryptic Slaughter. Just would let you know that your photo of my old apartment in Santa Monica is 100% accurate. Ours was the front apartment on the right side, 1130 Chelsea Avenue, apartment A. It didn't look like that when I lived there, though. I'm sure I can dig up a photo or two if you're interested. I can totally appreciate this project. I don't think I understood how much of an influence my surroundings had on me until I got older. Cheers, Les. Um, I mean, this was a band I listened to when I was a teenager. I actually sent them fan mail and their bassist wrote me back and I would have tried to interview them for my zine, but they broke up before I could do that. And then Les sent me this delightful photo of himself and a friend uh, on an Easter egg hunt. Um, outside of their 
apartment. Um, something I never expected from this project is that I would develop all these friendships with these people and these groups I listened to because I went to the trouble to find their parents' houses on Google Street View. I had no sense of like how people would feel about this project. Um, it was a really great surprise um, how how happy it made um, people in these bands. Um, and there's always this really enjoyable tension between the name of the group and the house that the members of that group um, lived in. This is suburban mutilation in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I was doing an interview about this project and I talked about how much I loved this house and band name combination and like the beautifully mowed lawn and the singer from this group saw the interview and shared it on social media and gave a shout out to his dad for doing such a great job on the lawn because his father still lives there. Uh, this is Source of Violence in Indianapolis, Indiana. Capitalist Casualties in California. I should have like tried to find some Texas bands for this talk. I, I, I completely failed. There is the band The Offenders House is is definitely included in the project. Um, Chronic Disorder. Um, these swans, I would assume, probably came later in the life of the house. Uh, Screaming Bloody Leper Children in Redford, Michigan. Blasphemous Exhumed Lunch in Fairfax, Virginia. Insolent Respect. This is the house, I think, that is closest to where I live in Chicago. This is about a mile from me. Um, I don't think I found anything closer to my neighborhood. Um, and then in making this project, there's a blog, but also I have to make printed material for everything. This is a flyer uh, for an exhibit of the project. And it was shown a couple times in these struct galleries that are run um, from people's houses, which I thought was just perfect for this project. Uh, this is at the Franklin, um, a space in the backyard of Adra Soto and Dan Sullivan um, in Chicago. And this was a space called Outhouse uh, in the backyard of Katie Fisdale and Albert Stabler in um, Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. It was like a former professor who lived there, his like writing shack and some installation photos of that. Um, I designed a photo booklet um, that kind of mirrors the blog um looks um so it kind of looks a little bit in some ways like a like a real estate guide which i think is is great um it's quite slick and i also did a number of interview publications and finally got to realize the lifelong dream of interviewing les evans from cryptic slaughter um it's probably the longest interview he's given in his life as well as uh grace ambrose who was one of the last managing coordinators at Maximum Rock and Roll. And I was in San Francisco and visited their um, uh, headquarters, which was also like a childhood dream come true and just a great experience. So um, I think coming on the heels of um, what an amazing experience of uh, working on that project was that like Harold Washington Library had this material that I just didn't believe that they would own, I decided to make the public library as an institution um, a feature of a publication series. This is really the first booklet series I've made since doing my zine that actually has these numbered sequential issues like a magazine. I think of it as sort of like a periodical and artist book hybrid. Uh, this is Harold Washington in Chicago. Um, I teach quite close to here, so it's a great place to visit on the way home from work. Um, and the library just has a ton of things that, and I realize all libraries, all major libraries are like this, where you know there are always things in special collections and archives behind the counter that basically nobody is looking at. And I thought that in addition to satisfying my own curiosity and using the library as a kind of meditative space or like an extension of my studio or visiting kind of the way that someone else might like visit, like you might visit a flea market or a museum where you're um, as if a flea market and a museum have like that much to do with each other. But uh, as though, um, you know, like where you're sort of hoping to um, 
to find something that you don't already know about or discover something new or, or have this kind of like experience of chance. Um, and so, um, so these are the first two issues. So every issue, these are all like half letter format. Um, usually the cover, the covers are always offset printed. The interior is sometimes offset, sometimes printed on a risograph. Um, I make about 500 copies of each issue. They're all kind of one and done, printed one time, no plans to reprint anything when it sells out, just to sort of like to keep things moving. Um, every issue has a completely different subject. They tend to be 32 to 40 pages or so. Um, the first issue uh, draws on an industry magazine called Corrections Today, and it focuses on advertising from that publication um, over a 10 year period. Uh, the second issue uh, with Alice Coltrane on the cover there is uh, devoted to publicity photos, promo photos, also um, taken by photographers uh, that were sent to the Chicago Reader, which is to celebrate its 50th anniversary, its long running free culture newspaper in Chicago. And at some point they purged all of these photos from their offices and gave them to the library. And it's about 50 to 70,000 photos of every genre of music. And I went through just the first three letters of the alphabet and made um, extremely subjective selections based on like photos I liked, based on um, music I was interested in, uh, based on creating unexpected juxtapositions of things like the Swedish black metal, uh, you know, genius Quorthon from Bathory alongside Art Blakey and Anthony Braxton. Um, Big Boys from Texas, um, photographed by Bill Daniel. Uh, interestingly, um, I had no idea Bill had photographed them back in like 1983 or something. Uh, this is like the big page, you know, Big Mike and the Big Boys, also Agent Orange. This is like the striped shirt page with Sandra Bernhard, the cars and the action swingers. Um, so I, I had just an enormous amount of fun going through this collection. It was something that the library had had for about eight years when I started looking through it. And one of the librarians told me I was the first person to actually ask to see it because it's something you have to request. Issue number three surveyed uh, the business periodicals collection, uh, which is one of my favorite sections of the library. It's filled with all of these really unusual specialty magazines. And unless you were in a particular industry, you'd probably never know existed. Uh, suspect methodology was about a extremely unethical research study that manipulated um, uh, police mugshot photos. Um, a handbook of library ideas was this straight up reprint of a small booklet by a um, kind of self appointed. Um, what would you say, like um, advisor to libraries, uh, Dale Schaffer. Um, this is filled with just amazing ideas for libraries, like libraries could lend out small animals alongside books on how to care for those animals to children uh, was one suggestion. A lot of his, his, his ideas are great and they're things that are actually in place. Um, a library in Chicago, uh, not too, too far from me. There's a lagoon across the street from the library and you can actually go to the library and borrow a fishing rod. Um, so libraries are not just for books, um, obviously. Uh, Notice to the Trade is um, probably one of the strangest publications in the series. It focuses on these legal notices uh, published in a toy manufacturer's magazine where companies are threatening, they'll post these legal notices uh, threatening people who um, who might consider stealing their uh, trademark. Um, and it's like, they're a toy company, but they're also, you know, a business. So there's this weird, funny mix of like trying to be cute and also um, very stern. Uh, so, you know, we've invested a great deal of resources to create and merchandise an enchanting little girl named Strawberry Shirtcake and her many friends who live in Strawberry Land. 
Thus, we will not tolerate anyone stealing our children. We've already stopped several firms who have infringed upon our rights, and we intend to vigorously pursue any manufacturer, distributor, or retailer who attempts to unfairly profit from our success. Typically, there would be like maybe one or two notices like this per issue. Some issues might not have any. So always with this project, I'm thinking about um, like subjects that are not too big, not too small, are kind of just right for a 36 page publication. Um, so in terms of like legal notices, threatening legal notices by toy manufacturers, 36 pages is like quite a lot of that, right? That's a large collection of those kinds of legal legal notices. Um, threats against messing with Potbelly Bear or Garfield characters. Um, issue number seven is about uh, VHS tapes the library was purging from the collection. Um, therapy art uh, draws on about a dozen art therapy books or books where art is used for um, some kind of psychological evaluations. Um, and normally images like this would be accompanied by probably two pages of subject patient analysis. Um, in this booklet, I, I, I wanted to make something that let this art kind of breathe as these anonymous examples, people who maybe continued making art, maybe never made art again, um, really just kind of letting the viewer appreciate these as these images that turn up in these journals and, and books as, as creative works in their own right. Um, a lot of these evaluations have some a section where people are asked to draw a house or draw a tree. Um, and then how they draw those things is interpreted by analyst. Um, so these would be two examples from the draw a tree section of the experience. Um, some very dated fashions on um, representations of people. Kind of looks like Sonny and Cher or something on the left. Um, issue nine focuses on the Chicago artist files. There's this fantastic archive of anyone who's had a couple exhibits in Chicago can give materials to the library and they'll file it. Um, so that's a really rich collection filled with just thousands of pieces of paper. Um, health and safety uh, is about um, workplace safety publications produced by the US government in the 1970s that University of Illinois at Chicago's library has a rich collection of in their government documents collection. Uh, number, numbers 11 and 12 were produced during the COVID pandemic um, and forced me to dig deeper into um, online archives. Defense drama is about um, military training photos um, that are archived in Maryland, uh, featuring all kinds of disturbing uh, hostage taking exercises. And incredibly, they have these like high resolution, amazing photos, thousands of them that are completely unrestricted. Um, so I was able to make a publication uh, of that material. It's, it's, it's super dark. Um, um, it sort of came out of like all of the police response to protests, uprisings after uh, the murder of George Floyd. Um, as, and also like all these people doing testing dressed in hazmat suits and things like that. It was like very much inhabiting the mindset of um, the kind of mental space of that time. Uh, Montana Prison News uh, focuses on a prisoner published newspaper that I found many copies of scanned on archive.org. Um, this is the most recent issue. Uh, I had started this at, before the pandemic and then libraries closed to the public for a long time or were not browsable anymore. They were only doing curbside pickup. And um, this is a collection of um, food industry imagery. Um, and it kind of started thinking about like the kind of um, material in Irving Goffman's book, Gender Advertisements, about these kinds of like, you know, male, female, heteronormative relationship sort of dynamics in advertising and like all the sexual innuendo 
of that and then it kind of got into like the sort of capitalist surrealism of food photography and um and just like the discomfort of unmasked people around food or this architecture that on the right is just simply an ad for a walk-in freezer but to me started feeling like these kind of improvised interior indoor but also outdoor um structures restaurants were creating to deal with um restrictions on indoor dining to create like a new kind of indoor dining but outside uh, <laughs> just as dangerous um so that was the last that's the most recent issue of library excavations i kind of i started in 2015 i come back to it kind of whenever i feel like it at this point probably 90 percent of the work is trying to figure out what to do um what a, a subject is that holds my attention that I think is a good fit for the project. Um, so I struggle with that more than the design or anything of that nature. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, the idea and, and project publications that resulted from this idea of a meal-based artist residency. Um, about maybe six years ago, I visited Kansas City to give a lecture at Kansas City Art Institute and a young artist, Sean Starowitz, reached out to me. We had already met briefly in Chicago and he wanted to offer me uh, what he called a burnt ends residency, which consisted of bringing an out of town artist, um, picking them up, showing them around a little and buying them barbecue at uh, one of Kansas City's many delicious barbecue establishments. Um, and he, I think he only did about maybe six of these residencies. It was a sort of semi-official project, but didn't have a extremely long life. But I always remembered um, how generous that felt, um, how rewarding that was as an experience. Um, of course, it was also really delicious. Um, I'm a terrible person to buy barbecue for because I don't eat red meat. So I had like the biggest turkey sandwich of my life. Um, but um so i live very close to this place uh jungbu market which um is a asian market with a small korean food lunch counter in the back it's about seven blocks from my house and often if someone was visit, visiting from out of town and they were, we were hanging out at my house and got hungry but didn't want to like do anything fancy or spend a lot of money I would take them to the lunch counter at Jungbu and people really liked the food. Like the food was, is so cheap that people don't get this like guilt trip. Like, you know, oh, oh, like, you know, like, please don't pay. Like, you know, like, like, don't make me put you out for this like bibimbap that costs $6 and 50 cents. Like people can kind of handle you buying them a meal that costs seven or $8 or something. It's uh, it doesn't make them, it's not uncomfortably generous to buy someone lunch there. Um, so I hit on this idea that I would actually, after do, taking a few people there, just like as friends, as guests, that I would I would formalize this and actually call it a residency program where artists who lived outside of Chicago could apply and I would buy them, you know, the entirety, entire residency would consist of me buying them lunch at Jungbu, our conversation and me writing a little report for social media for like Facebook and Tumblr um, and ultimately this publication about like what we talked about. And I'd usually take like a celebratory photo at the end if they were okay with that. Um, in two years, this hosted, I uh, hosted 38 residents. Um, there were some people I knew already, but maybe hadn't seen in 10 years. There were people I knew, but probably had never talked to for more than like 20 minutes at, after a lecture they gave. There were um, people I'd never met before, people I only knew online, had never met in person. Um, and, you know, and then and definitely like complete strangers who I met for the first time when we found each other inside Jungbu or in the parking lot. Um, sometimes we would do other things in addition to having the meal, like go somewhere or a couple people stayed at my house. Um, but um but mostly you know it was an hour long and it was a really productive hour i mean we you know there are people who had like particular things that they came armed with wanting to discuss uh like they wanted feedback on a project they wanted to ask me about something specific in my own work they had they wanted to 
have a conversation about something they were working on um, that they had questions about. Um, it was great. Love doing it after 38 times, it started to feel like, um, you know, less like an experiment and more like I was becoming a tour guide of the lunch counter at Jungbu and the market itself. Um, so I think you always have to figure out like in your own work, you know, like, when do you stop? Like, what's a stopping point on a project? And to me, when it starts to feel routine or rote or, you know, um, predictable, then it's probably time to like put it to rest. Um, around this time um, that I was wrapping that up, uh, there were, there are always protests in Chicago around police violence. But there were an increased number of police uh, protests um, happening simultaneously in response to other police murders around the country, as well as in Chicago, um, the murder of Laquan McDonald by uh, ex now ex CPD officer Jason Van Dyke, and um, this is criminal court in Chicago in the Chicago's uh, little village neighborhood, which is. Uh, primarily uh, heavily Mexican part of the city. Um, I'd been in this building a couple times for jury duty. Um, I am someone who, when interviewed for jury duty, is uh, not picked uh, in my experience so far, um, based on uh, two times of being interviewed. Um, but I was always really interested in that experience and what happens in court. And in addition to all of these protests that I was also attending, I saw somewhere maybe on social media that pre-trial hearings were beginning for Jason Van Dyke and that this is something that as activists we should try, people should try to attend. And that was that kind of unlocked for me this idea that court is a thing you can go to and observe without having to be there for your own court case or on a jury because of course lots of things happen that don't result in jury trials that are decided in other ways. Um, or there are just lots of meetings in advance of trials or around cases. Um, so I went to um, pre-trial hearings. Um, there were other activists in the court who were super helpful in explaining to me, things to me on recess. I found confusing because um, there's a lot that's just very hard to understand or hard to hear. And at one point, um, I went in one day, you know, went through the whole process of going through the metal detector. There was a second metal detector outside the courtroom for this particular case. Um, the judge in the case is hyper authoritarian. And after about five minutes, court went into recess until the next day because someone needed to get some file they didn't have. This is like very normal. And I was like, well, shit, like I, you know, spent all this time like driving down there and morning rush hour traffic and trying to find a place to park. I was like, well, like I'm already in the building. Like there are about 20 other courtrooms in this building. I should go walk into a different one and see what's going on, see what a different court is like. And so I went into another courtroom and I sat down next to this young man. And uh, what was taking place was a young woman um, was having her sentencing hearing. And the man next to me at one point got up and um, served as her character witness. He turned out to be her younger brother. And after he spoke his piece, um, soon after that, she was sentenced to several years in prison. Um, she had assaulted the girlfriend, his, her lover's other girlfriend. Um, and I sort of sat next to this young man, like watching his sister get sent to prison. Um, in that moment, I was by myself. There was not someone I could ask about or compare notes with, I certainly wasn't going to ask this man who had just seen this like thing happen to his family, you know, family member. Um, it occurred to me then, like at, on that day, that the next residency I do should be that I should bring artists to court with me, and then we would talk about what we observed. Um, at the same time, businesses were uh, suffering greatly in Little Village because there were uh, was an increase in ICE deportation sweeps, uh, sweeps. and um, one of those businesses uh, affected is my uh, Taqueria El Milagro, who make the best tortilla chips and tortillas in Chicago. Fortunately, their factory workers are on strike now, 
because um, the working conditions need to be improved in their factories. Um, so I'm boycotting El Milagro products at the moment, which is painful. Their chips are so good. Um, but workers come first. So after court, um, myself and the resident would eat lunch at Taqueria El Milagro. I'd buy lunch. I would also um, make a $20 donation to the Chicago Community Bond Fund for each residency, which is about the cost of lunch for two people at El Milagro. Um, for this project, I do not take did not take smiling photos of residents eating tacos. Felt kind of inappropriate given the sort of things we were discussing. Um, so the photo, the documentation of this is more like people's hands and notebooks and food, uh, perhaps, or like the end of our meals um, notebooks. Um, so for this project, every four we would record our conversation transcribe it, edit it together. Sometimes the resident would want to make an additional piece of writing and I would turn it into a publication. Um, each publication had four conversations in it. Um, this was um, uh, one of the first residents, the first resident, Peggy Piero, who was visiting Chicago from Brussels, um, had observed court in Paris, but never in the US. Um, so that was, a really amazing experience for her and also for me because we could compare, you know, the court system in these different countries. Uh, conversation with Dmitry Samarov, who does draw from life extensively. Um, so uh, he made drawings throughout the entire time as well as taking other notes. Um, I did attend multiple days of the Jason Van Dyke trial uh, with artist residents um, and that became uh, became evident with that that um like you could watch these things on television like sometimes like sometimes they were filmed and broadcast live on youtube um or on national media and i went to this trial multiple times um and uh there's me in the back row Wes jans who was the um resident uh that day um Jason Van Dyke's wife, the head of the Fraternal Order of the Police, of police, uh, the nun at Jason Van Dyke's church, Jason Van Dyke's father over here, um, activist who was instrumental in uh, forcing the release of uh, video footage of Jason Van Dyke shooting Laquan McDonald. This is Jamie Calvin of uh, Invisible Institute, um, amazing organization in Chicago who've uh, created incredible databases of police abuses. Um, this is a cover of the second booklet. This is a lawyer's office on the back of a Popeye's chicken restaurant across the street from the court. Um, I went to the sentencing hearing of Jason Van Dyke. That was a nine hour day in court uh, with Josh Rios. They give you these like weird spectator stickers. Uh, feels like a kind of horrible term in relation to observing court like it's like a sporting event which i guess for lawyers it is um sentencing hearing was broadcast live on many many news stations um the cover of the third booklet um you can't bring a camera or any kind of electronic devices into court so all of my photography around is on the outside of the court um this is a uh, incredibly decrepit parking lot attendant booth directly across the street from criminal court. It looks like almost like a photo collage, but that that really is a view that you can see. And this project was, so this was the last thing I was working on before the pandemic. I was all set to go to court, I believe on March 13th and my resident had to cancel at the last minute and um, you know, and then it just became immediately clear my teaching was canceled for later in the day. Um, and it just became clear like everything was gonna was grinding to a halt. And um the project ended. I haven't resumed it. Um court, I'm not even sure if you can attend in person yet. For a while they were using YouTube Live, which was really strange uh for some cases. Um but that kind of effectively ended the project. Um I feel like I'm running, I'm, I'm lagging on what I want to show. So this might be the last thing I'll present. 
Um, so my project quarantine, uh, I started on March 15th. Um, it was really important to me to figure out very quickly some way to be creatively active during this period that was so uncertain. Um, all of my teaching work was on pause. Some of it shifted online. Some of it was done for the year, um, couldn't be resolved uh, in a way that could happen online. All kinds of things were canceled. And I wanted to figure out, I wanted to continue publishing. I wanted to do it in a way that I thought made sense for this moment. Um, so I've always been really interested in single page, single sheet of paper publications um, where everything you need is on the front and back of a single page. And I thought this would be a perfect time to explore this. Um, in temporary services, both Brett and I each have the same Resograph duplicator model. Uh, one lives at his house, one lives across from my desk here in my basement. And um, it prints very quickly, cheaply. I had all kinds of leftover paper. I had ink. I had supplies to print with. Um, and I decided, so I came up with this name Quarantine with this like great epiphany that this would be like a genius name for a publication. It turns out like a million other people had the same epiphany and called their own publications Quarantine. I thought that was great. I'm against competition. I love the idea that if someone like hosts, you know, hashtag Quarantine, all kinds of different things come up. It's like everyone gets to share the name. And uh, every issue has the same basic ingredients, a masthead, uh, a printed space for creative work produced during the COVID-19 pandemic, issue number, the, to the date of publication, and there's a little credit at the bottom on the other side. Um, so this first issue, uh, I went outside, my compost pile was starting to thaw and worms were finding their way back into eating my banana peels and our coffee grinds. And um, I took out, I, I like the idea of these worms being just completely oblivious to what everyone else was uh, freaking out about. So I washed a bunch of them off, took their pictures, and then uh, created a layout, put them back in the dirt and uh, let them go about their, their way. Um, I immediately threw this out to other people as an opportunity to collaborate and to um, to create content uh, that I would publish. A uh, second issue um, published two days later was by Laura Stemple, someone I've known for a while but never worked with on anything creatively, who um, wrote about her concerns about living alone, depression, uh, alcoholism um, relative to the pandemic. Um, Happily, I saw her about a week ago and she's doing great. Um, but people use this for completely different purposes. Uh, my goal was to make an issue every single day. I did ultimately make 100 issues in 100 days. Um, I think on the last day I printed three issues to try to catch up. Um, this issue was a memorial to my friend uh, Doro Boyum, who died early in the pandemic, um, not of COVID, but of cancer. And um, I wanted to remember her by writing these descriptions of her photograph. She was a really wonderful photographer as well as an amazing scholar of artist books. Um, this was my first experience of someone um, passing and it being impossible to have a memorial or service due to uh, the lockdown. So it, it felt in addition to wanting to memorialize her, it felt important to me to mark that moment. Um, an issue by Paul Nudd of these kind of comic drawings of uh, elaborate iron lungs and breathing machines. So really like a ton of different kinds of work could be accommodated by this two page format. Um, drawings of different, um, Breathing Apparatuses or Experiences of Breathing um, by Caitlin Costas. Um, this was by, I think Aubrey was no relation to me. He's the, the son of uh, some friends. I think he's probably about eight years old maybe when he made this. Um, and this was about his experience of Zoom in in school. I think it's probably one of like the most painfully accurate documentary publications of, of this period. Um, 
So I collaborated with people's children. I collaborated with former students, current students. Uh, this was like a sort of sarcastic um, children's activity uh, coloring page I created using patent application drawings of different mask designs, um, drawings trying to visualize breathing um, by Eric Ruin, uh, these kind of like ink drawings. Um, Eric's sister lives about four blocks. He's in Philadelphia, but his sister actually lives about four blocks away from me. And she was running around the neighborhood trying to find um, copies of these publications because I would paste them up in public. Um, uh, the murder of George Floyd um, impacted uh, the content that some people sent in. This was my issue about that um, that moment and how I dealt with my own rage. Um, this was a collaboration with Shuri Sims. Shuri is an undergraduate student at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Um, I was introduced to her over email by Suzani Slavic, who was my teacher more than half a lifetime ago in undergrad at CMU. Um, Suzani introduced me to Shuri. Shuri and I like went our own separate ways, uh, emailing each other. And uh, I published one of her drawings and um, her uh, her writing. Um, and um, so th these are some photos of how I distributed this uh, at first, this sort of like social distanced way of exhibiting this work. Um, one of my favorite things to do was attach copies to garbage in alleys, like these shelves and stuff leaning against walls. Um, that people might see when they're like walking their dogs or just going out for fresh air. You know, this was the first hundred days of the pandemic or, you know, um, so the city just had become very quiet and it really changed the experience of walking through the neighborhood. Um, electrical boxes were a great surface for posting things. Um, people throw out a lot of TVs in my neighborhood. Uh, it was fun texting a photo of this to the artist, Chris Kerr, and telling him like, hey, Chris, I saw your work on TV this morning. Um, dumpsters, I posted a lot of copies of issues on dumpsters. Um, this is the most ambitious public presentation um, in the links of uh, chain link fence in my neighborhood. Um, I'm gonna stop here maybe, because we've been going, well, I'll, I'll show one more project and then I'll stop. Um, I'll do it quickly. After the, so after making this um, 100 issues of Quarantine, I, I really liked the, I like this daily practice, right? Of um, where every day you create something start to finish and it's modest in scale individually, but then builds into, um, into quite a substantive project. Um, and that led to public collectors police scanner, um, thinking about, you know, the police uh, from an abolitionist perspective, not being able to return to court. Um, and I, it, I've listened to the police scanner in the past periodically. It's something that you used to need a fancy radio to do now you can find live streaming of different police channels online quite easily in many cities. Uh, in Chicago, there are about 12 different zones that the city is broken up into. And um, it's totally legal to listen to the police. The things that are not legal are like, you hear something on the police scanner and go and um, run to the scene of the action and intervene in some way, like don't do that. Um, but taking notes, you know, listening, and after spending so much time like with Dam, you know, in design, uh, designing things that way, I was also eager to um, do something just very basic. So I, this is like my my police scanner studio, which was like a table, some pens, some rubber stamps from Muji, and this um, cast off time st clock stamp that I found. Um, that I'd been kind of like, when I found the stamp, I was like this, I need to make a project about time like that uses this. Um, so every page I indicate when I start listening, when I stop listening, what day number it is in the project, 
uh, the day, month, day, year, and the day of the week. And I listened at all different times. And when it first started out, um, the note taking is pretty chaotic. Um, it gradually, it started, you know, you hear like all these different fragments of things that are happening, it can be very hard to follow. Um, and gradually things got more refined. Um, or in some cases, things became more spare, where I might just focus on one incident. So this was an incident where there was a man who appeared to be planning to commit suicide, um, was very agitated, and ultimately he calmed down and um, was taken off of a ledge. I guess he was going to jump from and walked home to his mother's house. So in this case, I only listened for 17 minutes. Um, everything was done in one listening session. The longest session was maybe an hour long. Other things were very short. Um, I feel like the design became more um, more coherent, I think. Um, this project, I mean, you know, like, it, it was absolutely brutal to, to listen to all this material. Uh, I mean, there were a ton of things that were um, just completely horrifying to hear about. Um, there are also ways that police characterize people that are horrifying to hear repeatedly, like describing someone as like a missing autistic, you know, or a known mental um, was the kind of description you would hear sometimes. Um, sometimes you would hear the dispatcher. The project was very much about the rapport between the dispatchers, 911 dispatchers and um, police officers. Sometimes um, I thought that the dispatchers had a kind of dismissive tone when they were sending police to respond to things. Other times I felt like they created a real sense of urgency and uh, um, that maybe affected how the police responded. Um, this is the one day I refused to listen to the police uh, because it was my birthday. So nothing happened that day. Um, and this was the last day of the project. Uh, there was a domestic disturbance. There was a, they use this term bonafide, which is always kind of quirky, like a bonafide DOA as opposed to a reported DOA. So it's, I guess it's like, it's like that it's been confirmed. So there was a bonafide burglary. There was uh, a banned customer at a Walgreens, a lot of crimes at Walgreens pharmacy, a lot of crime at McDonald's. Um, there was a protest, um, mental health disturbance. There's There are always a million uh, calls about this car needs to be moved. This car has been sitting in front of a house for two weeks. Someone wants it removed. This car is in a handicapped spot. I mean, there are just days where you felt like if cars didn't exist, police would have nothing to do. Um, and then this resulted in two publications, this single sheet of paper publication that's kind of like a found text poem um, created from many fragments of uh, things I heard called um, Chest Wound to the Chest. Um, it's probably one of the most eccentric things I heard described uh, during the project. Um, and then this larger book, which compiles everything. Um, so all 75 days um, I published together. Um, and yeah, the end of that project, um, it, it, by the end, I was really hating working on it and just kind of dutifully continuing to do it. And when I stopped, it felt like this big weight had been lifted off of me. Like I didn't, like it had been like the weight had been like sitting on me for weeks but I'd like gotten used to it or something. Um, it was it was amazing how different it felt to realize I did not have to do that. Um, so I'm gonna stop here and um, it went maybe a little long, but um, uh, yeah, super happy to answer any questions you have um, or anything else.